at the International Institute for Nanotechnology on the campus of Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. An unobtrusive building is home to potentially earth-shaking research. Here, and in other Northwestern research labs, a group of nanoscientists are dreaming big dreams. My dream is that the cure for cancer will ultimately come from inroads made through nanotechnology and, and using nanotechnology concepts in medicine. I would love to be helping people that have had serious accidents and keep them from becoming paralyzed. That is one of the dreams I have. If I can do that in the next five years, I'll be a very happy person. We've got to solve these energy problems. We've got to solve them in a sustainable fashion. We need to make a solar device that will capture the energy from the sun very effectively. The time scale to do what I'm talking about, if we made proper efforts, somewhere between 10 and 15 years. I think much as we face very, very big difficulties on the planet, um, I have great faith in the fact that the human race, as expressed by individuals, uh, can respond to any crisis and hopefully uh, they should come out on top. These scientists are messengers of hope, leaders of a new approach to solving problems that will change our world in profound ways. They are at the forefront of the nanotechnology revolution and they work at the epicenter of nano research, Northwestern University. They call it NanoU. Hi, I'm Chris Agos. Nanoscientists work with matter on an extremely small scale. A nano of anything is a billionth, that's with a B. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. How small is that? The idea is you take a dime, uh, you slice it a thousand times so that you have you now a thousand thinner dimes. You take one of those slices, slice it another thousand times, and now you have something that's about one nanometer thick. So imagine you take a hair from your head. I, I don't have many of those, so I, I, I'm not uh, able to do the experiment easily. But you take a hair and split it uh, 100,000 times. So the thickness of each one of those split ends would be about a nanometer. A nanometer is the distance your beard grows between the time you reach to pick up the razor and the time you touch it to your face. Your beard grows a nanometer. That's a billionth of a yard. It's not very much. Now for those of you who had a bit of a close shave in science class, here's a little refresher. An atom is the smallest size in which matter exists. Atoms range from 3 to 10 nanometers in width, depending on the type of atom. One or more atoms make a molecule. Molecules are the smallest particle of a substance that have the unique qualities of that substance. For example, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen make a molecule of water. Nanoscientists work with individual atoms and molecules to engineer structures, molecule by molecule, from the bottom up. Let's take everything and break it down into really small building blocks figure out what the properties of the building blocks are, and then pick the ones that work and reassemble them into a device or into a structure that has the perfect properties for a given application. We rely on both molecular recognition and self-assembly. Molecular recognition, put it its simplest, is that one molecule will recognize another and it will be a happy marriage and they will stick together loving each other with tender care for the most part. Their act of actually coming together is what we refer to as self-assembly. You can tailor uh, the, their properties and then you can create completely new materials. You can also create completely new devices that really improve quality of life. Let's recap. Nanoscientists make their own molecules, molecules that did not exist before, molecules with specific characteristics. These are smart molecules that self-assemble into tiny parts, structures that mimic the behavior of nature, even improve on nature, to benefit mankind. Chad Merkin is the director of Northwestern's International Institute for Nanotechnology. With nanotechnology, one of the basic premises is that everything when miniaturized is different. 
when you take silver and break it down into really small particles or learn how to synthesize it in small particle form, it can be that color, or it can be that color, or it can be a nice northwestern purple, uh, or it can even be that color. Uh, so this is one material and four completely different colors or optical properties. Uh, and, and that's basically true for all, all materials, that when you miniaturize and make them into really small particles, they'll end up having very different properties from the bulk material from which they derive. The stained glass windows in the great cathedrals of medieval Europe contained nano-sized particles of silver and gold. Glassmakers found that adding these finely powdered metals to molten glass made the windows change color at different times during the day, though they were not sure why this was true. Nanotechnologists today tell us that the light absorbed by the nanoparticles of gold and silver is different in color from the light reflected by these particles, which accounts for the mystical quality of the stained glass windows. This nano principle was used even earlier in history. A Roman glass cup made in the 4th century AD is an opaque green when viewed away from direct light, but turns a translucent red when light passes through it. Again, nano-sized particles of silver and gold in the glass are responsible. But what does all this have to do with you? Coming up, we'll show you how gold is being used to build nanostructures, and how those nanostructures will one day in your lifetime help regenerate damaged spinal cord tissue, destroy cancer cells without harming healthy ones, make computers you can't see with the naked eye, and solve the world's energy crisis. Stay tuned. Since 1981, scientists have used atomic force microscopes with tiny attachments to read the surface topography and characteristics of material at an atomic level, basically to gather information. Dr. Chad Merkin and his group of nano researchers at Northwestern have turned this microscopic technology around and invented a way to write on materials at an atomic scale to actually build nanostructures. One of the things we've invented here is a process called dependental lithography. Now hold on just a nanosecond here. Let's spell that out for everyone. Dip, pen, nano, lithography. Well, dip pen doesn't sound very high tech to me. Many in the press have, have uh, called this the invention of the world's smallest pen. Well, the uh, original pen, the quill pen, was invented in China 4,000 years ago writing really revolutionized communication. Our premise uh, in, in the development of a dependent orthography is that if we could do the same on the nanometer length scale, we could revolutionize not just communication, uh, but many types of technologies that require printing. We came along and said, hey, let's try to turn this into a writing tool or a building tool, and let's learn how to use this much like we use a pen on paper to deliver molecules to a surface so that we could build architectures from the bottom up where we deliver one layer of molecules on a surface with the resolution of this very sharp tip which can actually pattern uh, down to the 10 to 15 nanometer length scales. The ink in these pens could be any material that can be transported from the tip of the pen to a surface. Merkin's group has used DNA, proteins, and other building blocks of life to create nanostructures with life-saving potential. The researchers in Merkin's labs use atomic force microscopes driven by software that allows them to control the movement of the pens. So all of this instrumentation is housed on uh, vibration tables. And if you look around this room, we have these acoustically designed rooms that uh, are designed to minimize uh, uh, vibrations from sound. And that allows us then to build uh, structures with extremely high precision and we can effectively take anything. I could take your picture, I could take a, a, an electronic circuit, I could take a, a, a gene chip, uh, program the instrument to then deliver the right types of molecules on the nanometer length scale to make that particular structure in a matter of minutes. To prove his point, Merkin's group reproduced a copy of this page using a single layer of molecules. The reproduction was so small that 80 million copies could fit in one square inch. Now, what about the surface Merkin's group uses as the platform, or the paper, in his quill pen analogy upon which nanostructures are built? Remember the special optical qualities of nano-sized particles of gold and silver? Well, researchers have also found that these metals are ideal for nano-building. Atoms and molecules tend to behave well when they're placed on gold or silver. But 
How practical is dip pen nanolithography? I mean, isn't it kind of laborious and inefficient to create nanostructures molecule by molecule from the bottom up? The critics of this type of technique would say, well, that's going to take you forever. So our answer to that was, again, to follow the, 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 the blueprint of, of the development of, of the modern uh, printing industry and, and to go from a single pen type of system to a multiple pen system where we can create now many duplicates. It's like going from the original Gutenberg press to a modern high-speed printing press. So we have now arrays that have as many as 11 million pens that are simultaneously generating these types of structures and surfaces over large areas. Northwestern has launched a startup company, Nano Inc., to develop the commercial applications of dip pen nanolithography. DPN could easily become the mass manufacturing capability, the nano assembly line for the many nano devices that will change our lives in the nano revolution. Coming up, isn't it a drag when you or a loved one have to wait days for test results from the doctor's office? Well, those days are history. At Northwestern's International Institute for Nanotechnology, researchers are developing diagnostic tools that will revolutionize medicine. We are ramping up here heavily uh, in, in, in making or developing new types of diagnostic tools, for example, that allow us to detect cancer much earlier than we can with conventional diagnostic tools. Why? Well, most people in our cancer center and anywhere in the world will tell you that if you can detect cancer early enough, you can at the very least treat it and you can often cure it. Merkin has developed a chip which uses gold or silver nanoparticles to latch onto disease markers from a blood sample and provide an amplified response. Each positive will be a, a bright silver spot. So every one of these is a positive for a particular disease target. And each one of these is an individual test for a different disease target. So the beauty of this is I can have a chip that can simultaneously interrogate a sample for dozens if not hundreds of targets in one shot and at very, very low cost. Merkin says these tools can detect disease in less than an hour. Another startup company called Nanosphere has developed FDA-approved tests that will soon be used in hospitals. And now you can think about moving diagnostic tools from remote labs, which is where most of the testing is done now, to hospitals, uh, the emergency room, eventually the doctor's office, and hopefully one day even the home. It gets you the information faster. You don't have to wait days to get your lab results. You can get them right then and there. And that's critical in terms of treatment. You'd like to go into the doctor's office and in five minutes have him tell you, well, you need to get your tetanus shot boosted up because you're not ready for it yet. You have the following three inherited genetic diseases that you didn't know about, but maybe you should stop eating fava beans. Um, and no, you haven't been exposed to, I don't know, HIV in the last two months. That all should be doable, and it should be doable very quickly. Um, by the time you get out of the office, you should be able to know. Early cancer detection has garnered the most attention, but Merkin's nanodiagnostic tools can also detect the presence of Alzheimer's, diabetes, and hundreds of other diseases. You're creating portable systems, which open up new types of applications. This technology has even drawn the interest of the military field-based applications, biological det or detection of biological warfare agents, for example, det detection of, of uh, biological weapons that are used, for example, in, in terrorism. In terms of 9-11, you know, how did we know whether the white powder in the post offices was anthrax or talcum powder? And if you remember, it took them three days before they decided it was not anthrax, and they did it again. Well, if you could do these tests on nanoparticles, nanostructures, You'd actually do this, I mean, Chad's shown that you can do this in, in a couple of seconds. Like Chad Merkin and Mark Radner, Sam Stoop has appointments in more than one school at Northwestern. In his case, medicine, chemistry, and materials science. He believes there are better days ahead for those who break bones or tear tissue in their body. You break a bone or you rupture some cartilage in your knee. Or if you have osteoarthritis and have very little mobility and pain as you get older, then they put these huge devices, you know, in these, these parts in your, in your joints, in your body. So, for example, this is one of the metal pieces that is used to repair the hip joint. This is a plastic part that's part of that hip joint. So these two parts fit together 
And you see now you can move your leg very easily. But imagine having these huge pieces of metal and plastic in your own body. Or they'll take, if you have a, a long bone fracture, you fracture your femur or something like that. They will take, for example, these bone plates and these go with screws. So doesn't that look to you like something you'd buy at a hardware store, right? Stoop is the director of IBNAM, the Institute for Bio-Nanotechnology in Medicine. He and his group are on the verge of making those large metal and plastic parts obsolete. The world that nanotechnology is, is bringing in this field, uh, we call it broadly regenerative medicine. So that means gaining the capability to regenerate the tissues and organs of your body. And it can impact deeply uh, the quality of life for humans everywhere. Coming up, we'll find out what can be regenerated and how that'll change the lives of people like you and me. This is a solution. Sam Stoop and his team at the Institute for Bio Nanotechnology and Medicine at Northwestern University are developing revolutionary ways to treat broken bones and damaged tissue. They want to make the use of hardware in the body a relic of medical history. Instead of using these parts, uh, then maybe there is a very highly non invasive injection of something uh, by non invasive surgery that causes the bone to regrow very rapidly. Or let's say if you're missing a piece of cartilage in your knee joint, and cartilage is a tissue that unfortunately, once we turn 18, it doesn't regenerate spontaneously. So the question is, can we use some new capabilities to cause that cartilage to grow in adults? That will really transform uh, uh, medical practice. A non-invasive injection that'll cause bones and tissue to regrow? Sounds bionic, but it is a reality. Stoop has even found a way to regenerate damaged tissue in the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, something the body cannot do on its own. So that's where my nanofibers come in. We have found a way by self-assembly to make these very smart molecules that when they find each other in a glass of water, uh, they come together into nanofibers. And these fibers were designed to talk to cells in our bodies and essentially tell them, look, I know that you normally don't regenerate, but we are here to tell you that you should. One type of cell that Stoops nanofibers talk to are neurocells, which are like electrical cables connecting the brain to the body's limbs. When neurocells in the spinal cord are broken, the brain's connection to the limbs is broken. The result is paralysis. But Stoops nanofibers send broken neurocells a signal to regenerate, and miraculously, they do. Using biological knowledge, we thought rationally what type of fiber could make them do that. And so we went to the lab and actually designed the molecule and also designed it so that it would become a fiber, a tiny fiber. The next challenge was to design a delivery system for these magical nanofibers. Stoop and his colleagues developed a special gel. The gel is formed into sac-like structures which hold the nanofibers in place. The gel also degenerates and leaves the body once the regeneration of tissue is complete. One of Professor Stoop's assistants is Ramil Capito. As far as uh, regenerating um, tissue, if we can have the gel stay where we want it to stay and then control its degradation, over time, so we need to regenerate and degrade sort of simultaneously or else you won't have a good tissue. The creation of smart molecules that self-assemble into nanofibers, which in turn send signals to damaged cells to regenerate, the development of the gel to hold these nanofibers in place, and the actual process of tissue regeneration. All of this took years of lab work and testing in animals. It's difficult because we really need to show safety and efficacy, especially when we're injecting materials in the body. And so getting through the FDA, doing the necessary uh, clinical trials, and seeing that it is, you know, efficacious, you know, that takes a long time. And I think the science, you know, we can discover something in a day, but we have to be lucky. But it's actually getting, taking that discovery and actually putting it through the process it needs to go through um, to actually get to a patient, that's, that's what takes long. The payoff for human patients should come within a decade. Stoop hopes that in five years, spinal cord paralysis will become a thing of the past. Stoop's regenerative process works for bones as well. 
Bones will regenerate naturally when fractures are small. However, when the space between fractured parts is too great, regeneration will not occur. But when Stoops gel is injected to fill in the gap between the broken bones, the nanofibers work their magic and new bone grows into place. Bone regeneration and cartilage regeneration are particularly important for elderly people. And so this would uh, keep uh, quality of life very high for, for that population. In addition to tissues and bones, Stoop and his colleagues are working on regenerating organs of the body, including the heart. In the process, they're creating thousands of different nanofibers, customizing each one to the tissue or organ they're trying to regenerate. Can nanotechnology create solutions for every problem we face? From a science uh, standpoint, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, there, there is a surprise every day. Uh, we, you know, I, I've given up thinking we can't do anything, right? <laughs> Coming up, we'll see how nanotechnology will impact computing, chemotherapy, the energy crisis, and more. The nano revolution is underway, and there is hope for the future. So the triangles are, are equilateral triangles. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it minimizes a certain kind of surface energy. Mm -hmm. so the particles are actually creating a structural component that lead to the assembly into this octahedral shape. Mark Radner is a theoretical chemist. He thinks about the problems and challenges facing the world and then imagines ways that chemistry can help find a solution. What I get paid for, and sometimes I think I'm pretty good lucky to pay for it, paid for it is to imagine stuff. And the best days that I have is a day that a really new idea comes to you. The best things that you do are the most imaginative things that you do. Even if you don't do them all that well. The thing I'm probably best known for is, is a paper that my very first graduate student wrote with me 34 years ago about how you could use a molecule to conduct electricity. And nobody ever thought of using molecules to conduct electricity. Radner became known as the father of molecular electronics. In the 1980s, he continued to work on this idea, studying which type of molecules could conduct electric current and why. How do molecules conduct current? And can you use that, for example, to do advanced electronics? In the early 1990s, Scottish chemist Fraser Stoddard made a breakthrough discovery. He found a way to make an on-off switch a few nanometers in size. He created a molecule shaped like a rod then created ring-shaped molecules that conducted electricity and slipped them onto the rod, much like a dumbbell is assembled for weightlifting. The molecules come together through self-assembly, or as Stoddart likes to call it, nature's stickiness. We use this stickiness to bring the parts together and then we usually fix them in some sort of way. In other words, we put a classical chemical bond or two in place. In other words, we put big stoppers on the end. We form the mechanical bond as well. Using mechanical stoppers to hold chemical bonds in place was a revelation. The rings that conducted electricity could be kept on the rod. The dumbbell was stabilized. Once we made the mechanical bond, they're not going to fly apart. They're going to be as um, stable and robust and long-lasting as uh, a commoner garden molecule like benzene or uh, acetone or whatever. Stoddart then figured out a way to control the back and forth movement of the rings on the rod. In other words, to control the flow of electric current. This allowed us at a very, very small level, and we're talking a few nanometers now, to make the smallest switch in the world. Here we were able to make, at that smallest of levels, entities that were capable of uh, reading information, storing information, processing information, and then writing it back out again. In other words, we had the basis for a molecular computer. Stoddart and his colleague Jim Heath then developed the basics of an electric circuit. Silicon wires, about 15 nanometers broad, were arrayed in a grid. The wires were then coated with a layer of Stoddart's dumbbell-shaped mechanically bonded molecules. At each cross point, there was a switch. The process has now been improved to the point where 160,000 switches are arrayed in a device smaller than a white blood cell. The challenge now for Stoddart is to create an integrated circuit on the nanoscale. We have uh, prided ourselves in going for the big device and, and uh, believe that uh, the way forward, not just for uh, doing work that's potentially going to give applications uh, in computing, but 
applications and everything is to go for the integrated devices. It's easy to continue day after day in these laboratories to do the things you know. It's much more difficult to uh, have a dream and try to do something that nobody's ever done before. This is tough. This is really tough. So tough that nano research cannot be done alone. In the world of nanotechnology, collaboration with other researchers is a must. Stoddart moved his entire research group from UCLA to Northwestern in 2008 because of Northwestern's environments of collaboration. It's really, I, I feel uh, almost inevitable that I should land up at Northwestern because I think of all the uh, places in the world that are you know, striving to be uh, competitive in the uh, Nano League. There is none more collaborative than this one. This is uh, where so many people uh, want to get together to address a problem. Effectively, we've come, become a, a magnet for the best students, postdocs, and faculty in the area of nanoscience and nanotechnology, and it's really had a, an incredible impact on the development of the, the science and engineering front uh, at Northwestern. Nanotechnology unites the different areas of science with engineering and material science. It's beginning to make all the connections between those disciplines, bringing biologists and chemists and material scientists together with medical doctors, for example, uh, to make discoveries that wouldn't be made if, if you worked alone. So I think that's one of the greatest gifts of, of nanoscience and nanotechnology in the sense that it's making people communicate across these disciplinary lines. It's easy to see how Fraser Stoddard could collaborate in the development of nanocircuits with Chad Merkin, whose dip pen nanolithography might provide a way to reproduce those circuits routinely. And Stoddard could certainly be expected to collaborate with the father of molecular electronics, Mark Radner. This is a relatively new area of science where uh, ignorance abounds, and so uh, you either say ignorance is bliss or you go to Mark Radner and uh, the um, ignorance is uh, made uh, uh, much clearer. Coming up, you'll see how two of Northwestern's nanoscientists are working to revolutionize chemotherapy for cancer patients. Sam Stoop, you'll recall, has invented nanofibers that signal tissues, organs, and bones in the body to regenerate when they might be broken, torn, or deteriorating from the aging process. He expects that one day soon, his nanofibers will eliminate paralysis from spinal cord injuries. However, like all of the nanotechnologists we've met, Stoop is not satisfied with that one miracle. He's hard at work on another one. We are very interested in producing nanostructures that can be targeted that can navigate after they are injected in a patient. They can navigate only to the site where they're needed. So this would reduce any side effects. And, and the most obvious way to use them would be in the treatment of cancer. There's a certain type of breast tumor that has a high content of a specific protein. And so that nanostructure enters into your bloodstream, into your circulation. And when it gets to that specific location, right, if it's able to exit the circulation and it finds this protein that it likes to bind to, then pretty soon all of the nanostructures will accumulate right there. So the, the tininess of these nanostructures is critical uh, for, the, for, for the concepts to work, for the therapies to work, because they're so tiny that they can get into tiny spaces. So for example, if you are inside a tissue uh, where it might be very dense, they can sneak through tiny holes and they can navigate to the right places very easily. Practitioners of nanotechnology take absolute delight in their ability to engineer molecules in the shape and size and with the exact properties they desire. It's a highly creative field. A lot of the beauty of chemistry is that you can have an idea in your mind and you can create that and it's niche in nanotechnology is that you can actually design something, make it, and have it perform in a function that you, um, you created or you, you anticipated. Um, and then to apply those functions at the nanoscale to get a macro scale outcome. A macro outcome is what Sam Stoop is after in his work to target cancerous cells in chemotherapy. Fraser Stoddard has an intensely personal stake in the success of this work. I lost my own wife from breast cancer in 2004, and this was after an incredible fight for 12 years. There are a lot of people out there 
who are presently having uh, chemotherapy and while one doesn't want to um, devalue the importance of it to patients, um, there is, in terms of a long fight with cancer, the attrition that comes from the indiscriminate uh, killing of cells, healthy ones as well as uh, diseased ones. If we can cut down the dosage by a thousand times, by ten thousand times, by a hundred thousand times, by a million times, you would not end up poisoning the patient. You wouldn't end up uh, in that final stage where the drugs are just as deadly to the patient as the disease. Stoop's team is working on ways to target cancerous cells without affecting healthy cells. Stoddard's team has been hard at work developing a delivery system for that very purpose. One of Stoddard's colleagues, Jeff Zink, developed a type of glass sphere riddled with cavities. Glass that was like a honeycomb, ideal for housing small molecules, such as chemotherapy drugs. The question then became how to control the entry and exit of the drugs. Remember Stoddard's mechanical bond? The stoppers that kept the electricity conducting rings on the dumbbell-shaped molecule that made molecular computing possible? We simply made the jump from the switch based on the dumbbell and the sliding um, ring from the computer uh, application to the uh, anti-cancer application. And so we said, let's close these um, spheres with um, stalks, the stoppers at the end of them, and with rings on each stalk. Of course, that's a no-brainer. Stoddard called his stalks with stoppers nanovalves, gatekeepers. And we showed almost, I think, to our surprise that uh, we could close these gates and um, more often than not see no leakage at all. It was really quite remarkable how uh, efficient they were. They keep the drug-filled cavities in the glass spheres closed, without leakage, until the moment they're needed to deliver the drugs. But how do they get to that point? They're extremely small compared to the cell, and so ultimately we want to, uh, of course, destroy the cell. Then. Um, we want to kill selectively the cancer cells and leave the healthy cells alone. Northwestern's nanoscientists are pulling out all the stops in the collaborative effort to find a cure for cancer. Ooh. Coming up, let's solve this energy crisis and keep the planet safe and clean while we're at it. A lot of what makes food taste good and taste bad has to do with the nature, the, the physical process of how large the particles are. Mm -hmm. Nanoscientists like Mark Radner are concerned about the things that worry most of us. The price of oil and gas, our reliance on foreign oil, and the lack of political willpower in America to take positive action for our future. We've got to solve these energy problems. We've got to solve them in a sustainable fashion because we don't want to drive ourselves off the planet with our emissions. So what are you going to do? And there are several different forms that this problem takes. You could conserve energy, you can store energy, you can transmit energy, you can supply energy. And it does seem that there are many different kinds of supply. The most obvious of them is the solar supply, because there's a lot of light. So you might as well start there. We need to make a solar device that will capture the energy from the sun very effectively, not at efficiencies around 11 or 12 percent, which is where molecular things are right now, not at efficiencies of around 20 percent, which is where the good expensive silicon devices are, we'd like to get really high. And we would like to be up at the 50 to 60 to 70 percent. There are devices to do that now. They're made by NASA. They send them up in spacecraft and their cost is, is simply out of the question. Right now you can make solar cells, you can buy them, you can put them on the side of your house, but they're not energetically efficient enough to really do a great job and on a cost replacement basis they're way too expensive. What you'd like to do is to make them that you could run off on a printing press. You want to make it sufficiently cheap and straightforward that you can, using molecular chemistry, make a solar photovoltaic device or a solar chemical fuels device. Well, a fuels device is a little different. Instead of making electricity, you make something you can burn, like hydrogen, for example. Nanotechnologists have this audacious confidence that they can design a molecule to solve every problem. In this case, they're talking about a molecule that's basically empty inside, a kind of 
fuel storage bin. They're sort of 99% nothing, but they're very robust because they're built on uh, scaffolds, metal organic frameworks, or for short, MOFs. And uh, these have a remarkable ability, don't they? What sort of right. things do they do? Well, with all the empty space inside, they can um, absorb lots of different kinds of molecules. One is to store hydrogen, and this hydrogen can later be used as a fuel in cars. Um, Hydrogen-powered cars are, would be uh, quite a lot cleaner. That would be very acceptable because uh, the only thing that comes from burning hydrogen is water, so uh, we are um, talking about a very, very clean environment. Given the intense research devoted to solving the energy crisis, what is a reasonable timeline to arrive at one or more solutions? The time scale to do what I'm talking about, if we made proper efforts, somewhere between 10 and 15 years. If we don't, it'll happen, but it's not going to happen here. Let's do it here, folks. Support your favorite nanotechnologist. Coming up, we'll find out how you are probably enjoying the nano life right now without even knowing it. And then we'll hear some final thoughts from our Northwestern University nano stars. Miracles of nanotechnology are on the horizon. A cure for cancer, solutions for the energy crisis, and molecular computing may only be a decade or so away. The elimination of paralysis and the regeneration of tissues, bones, and organs may happen sooner than that. The ability to diagnose hundreds of diseases instantaneously will soon be commonplace. But on a humbler scale, you might be surprised to know that the wonders of nanotechnology are with us now in our daily lives. Um, one of the applications of nanoscience, and certainly not the most important one, is all kinds of improved athletic equipment. So, you know, tennis rackets and fishing rods that are made with carbon nanotubes. I'm a trout fisherman, and I know that the graphite fishing rods I use now are much cheaper than the ones that were made out of bamboo that I bought with my own money a long time ago, which are still more expensive, but not as good. My son has a tennis racket with carbon nanotubes in them. Uh, it's supposed to give it greater strength and, and, and uh, uh, better uh, play. Uh, uh, these pants are, are coated with tiny particles that uh, uh, make them stain resistant. Uh, sunscreens uh, have had zinc oxide particles in them for the last decade that are nanoparticles and the small particles make them still very good UV light absorbers so we can protect ourselves from the harmful radiation of the sun. And, and uh, you're going to see it uh, uh, just uh, kind of seamlessly uh, get integrated. Uh, throughout almost all the products that we, uh, you know, depend upon every day. Though they are among the most distinguished chemists in the world, the Northwestern nanoscientists we've met don't take themselves too seriously. I think older scientists like me who pontificate can get it so wrong. Um, Lord Kelvin, who by marriage is related, I am almost shamefacedly having to say, predicted in the late part of the 19th century, there would be no man but flight. Okay, now there are 8,000 of these contraptions in the air carting millions of people across the planet. He might as well have uh, maybe said nothing on that point. Professor Stoddart was knighted by Britain's Queen Elizabeth. May I present to your majesty Professor Sir Fraser Stoddart for services to chemistry and nanotology. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was already pretty nervous, and, and you know, she's holding this very sharp knife, <laughs> not, not far from my neck, and I'm thinking, how do we deal with this? <laughs> well, whatever you might think of her, when we were face to face, he said, oh, he got that wrong, didn't he? And I said, he certainly did, your majesty. What should it be then? Nanotechnology. She got it right. Wow, you've got it right, ma'am. <coughs> it's about very small things, isn't it? <laughs> Indeed, it's about tiny things that are 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair, ma'am. That's exceedingly small. <laughs> Despite the fact I was brought up in a farm and uh, absolutely fascinated by nature, after 25 years of that, I wanted to get away from it. And so my driving force has been very much more abstract. Uh, I look at art, I think of music, I think of uh, 
novels and all kinds of things that are out there that are abstract and use that as uh, a means to grow bigger from my you know, background in chemistry. Stoddart's recent arrival at Northwestern solidified the university's place as the leading hub for nanotechnology research. The International Institute for Nanotechnology is a consortium that includes the Institute for Bionanotechnology in Medicine, coordinated by Sam Stoop, and the Argonne National Laboratories. The Institute has collaborative relationships with universities throughout the Big Ten and with other major universities like Harvard and Stanford. It has exchanged programs with universities in Singapore, Korea, Japan, and Germany. The goal is to create the next generation of leaders to propel nanotechnology forward. I am a teacher. I get my kicks out of watching people succeed. I get my kicks out of seeing human beings get into the science and really make progress in it. My students are uh, spectacular. They have a sparkle in their eye, you know, about uh, when, 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 uh, when they talk about their work, they're, they're extremely ambitious, they want to be successful, they want to be scientists, and they believe in, in the power that science has to make a better world. Among Northwestern's nanotechnologists, the excitement over the future is palpable. You can imagine, you know, when we get together, we, we you know, it's like fireworks, you know, we, we like to dream of, of grand goals. The impact of the nanotechnology revolution can be likened to that of the industrial revolution or the harnessing of electricity. The ability to understand nature on a nanoscale and to design, build and tinker with nanostructures that benefit mankind will change our world in profound ways. The impact is going to be enormous and, and, and felt across disciplinary lines and in every aspect of our lives. The more you learn about nanotechnology, the more you become hopeful for the future of our planet. A future greatly influenced by the work of the scientists at NanoU.